Uh, let's thank everyone for this uh, wonderfully comprehensive uh, and evidence-based but very clinically practical uh, series of talks. We're now going to invite uh, all the uh, presenters up to the stage. We have a number of great questions that you folks have submitted. Uh, and uh, the Frank has to leave uh, soon, so we're going to oppose uh, the questions directed to him first. Uh, uh, likewise, Dr. Sugar Daddy uh, had to leave early, uh, so we're not going to be able to address the uh, pouch question. So uh, my first sort of broad and, and somewhat nuanced question perhaps is, if a patient, uh, if a physician does uh, thorough, well-documented, uh, high-def white light endoscopy and subsequently dysplasia slash cancer develops, is that physician, you know, I'll use this term very carefully, mm -hmm. uh, deviated from the standard uh, of care for cancer detection rather than using chroma? So based on what we have in terms of the recommendations, using high definition white light endoscopy with multiple biopsies in a patient who has pancolitis, and that would be you know, the 32 to 36 biopsies throughout the colon is an option for surveillance for IBD related dysplasia. So that patient, that doctor would be practicing within the standard that, at one of the many standards. So I don't think there would be a medical legal issue there uh, in that patient. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Feel free to chime in. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, how do you uh, speak to the patient? What are your personal thoughts? The patient, you showed some of them who has dozens or even hundreds of pseudopolyps. So in a patient with innumerable pseudopolyps, you have to you know, basically tell them that even using the best possible technique that we have, it's going to be hard to find an area of dysplasia. In an individual with innumerable pseudopolyps, you certainly want to, I would do the multiple biopsies because that's another area of trying to lower that risk. But you have to be honest and say, in someone who's 45 years old, who's had 20 years of ulcerative colitis with innumerable pseudopolyps, it's going to be very, very hard. And are you more concerned about about having a pouch or you're more concerned about developing colon cancer. The overwhelming majority of people will basically say, continue to do the surveillance doc, I, I, I'm not ready for surgery. In the, in the future, uh, there's work going on using stool-based molecular markers that may, able, uh, may help us kind of identify someone who might be at higher risk, but right now it's, that's a discussion you have with the patient. And just finally, a technical question. Does scarred mucosa take up methylene blue? Yes, it should take up. Yes, yeah, so those that second image on the second slide, that uh, it won't take it up, but you'll see a nice covering of the mucosa. So the, the scarring doesn't preclude you from using chromoendoscopy. And the more focused question, perhaps, if you do have literally carpeting of the entire colon, and on some routine biopsies of these biopsies, and literally hundreds of carpets, we all see these. You do get an adenoma back on a biopsy. Are you going to tell the patient, "I'm going to survey you again," or that I just can't? tell you where the next one's going to be? Again, it depends on the clinical scenario, how old is the patient, how long they've had ulcerative colitis, but that's going to be a high-risk individual. That's someone that's worth doing a chromoendoscopy on, and again, if we knew that that random biopsy was from the right colon, and you do a scope and you find the lesion like I described, that might be someone that I would have more comfort in following them. But again, you just need to have that discussion with the patient. You're at high risk based on your male gender, your duration of disease, the innumerable pseudopolyps, and my inability to do surveillance. Uh, what would you like me to do? Continue surveillance, or would you like to see the surgeon? Now, again, if all those pseudopolyps were in the proximal colon or maybe sparing the rectosigmoid, that's a patient we, who does not have cancer. You can certainly do a segmental resection or an ileosigmoid anastomosis, because I do think from some of the other discussions we had in the breakout groups the other day that patients with even ulcerative colitis who have no active disease will do better with an ileosigmoid anastomosis than a pouch. Thank you very much. I think that's it for the um, chromodoscopy questions. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. So um, I have a question for Ashwin. This is a quickie. So can you use a fecal calprotectin to see if upper GI symptoms from Crohn's, um, if you think, it's, you think it's Crohn's versus GERD or functional symptoms, do you, does a fecal calpro work for our esophageal and gastric Crohn's? No, I think, the, I think it's an interesting thought, but the sensitivity is would be very low. It's low for allele compared to colonic Crohn's disease. I would expect the sensitivity to be even lower when you're going further up the GI tract. So a normal fecal calprotectin to me wouldn't mean much in terms of ruling out upper GI. Okay, question for Jesse. Uh, in a patient who has an 
essentially an asymptomatic stricture and the capsule gets retained proximal to that, do you feel comfortable leaving that capsule in for some indefinite period? Again, totally asymptomatic stricture. Yeah, um, the current recommendations are basically because of battery degradation and other risks uh, associated with that would be to remove it. So our current practice is if it's retained, you know, beyond several weeks to a month or so, uh, we will ask our advanced endoscopist to do a deep device-assisted enteroscopy, either anterograde or retrograde, to remove the capsule. We just don't feel comfortable leaving it in indefinitely based on, you know, some case reports of battery erosion and perforation. So, Ashwin, um, in the absence of granulomas on pathology, if you see ulcer ulcerations in the esophagus and stomach, how convinced are you? How do you determine that it's Crohn's rather than NSAIDs or something else? I, I, I think it's, it is very difficult. There isn't an appearance that necessarily will 100% say this is Crohn's. I think you look at the location. Obviously, if it's in the distal esophagus, it's probably still more common reflex esophagitis than actual Crohn's. If unusual locations within the stomach should raise your suspicion for this being Crohn's, NSAIDs always ask about can anything can be NSAID related. Unusual locations in the duodenum, very large ulcers. If you see sort of isolated ulcers in the second or third part of duodenum, nothing in the bulb, nothing in the stomach, that should raise your suspicion for Crohn's. Obviously ulcers that are not healing. Let's say you have a gastric ulcer, put them on a PPI therapy, scope them two months later, it still looks the same. That should raise suspicion for is there something else and could it be Crohn's? Okay, another question for Jesse related to retained capsules. Uh, in the patient who has barely symptomatic, asymptomatic strictures, and again, a retained capsule, because this is always a concern, and we sometimes see this even with a negative pain capsule, do you consider a course of uh, biologic therapy to try and treat the stricture, so to speak, before you call it a day and refer the patient to surgery? Yeah, I think that's a great question, not unreasonable. You know, if you think there's a significant inflammatory component to the stricture, it's not unreasonable to try at least induction with a biologic agent and over two months see if the um, capsule will pass, especially if the patient is averse to um, a device-assisted enteroscopy um, in, in the interim. So I think that, um, that that would be uh, my approach. Or sometimes a course of corticosteroids rather than biologics. You can give them a course of prednisone and see if there's enough opening of the strictures that they pass the capsule. Well, this is a question um, for both of you. Um, is there any data on injecting strictures in the upper GI tract to alleviate uh, them? Yeah, that, that, that's actually a great question. And I didn't really have time or the space to um, enter that. but. Um, the data suggests, in fact, that, that particular patient, I think Laurel did do an injection, which, which didn't help. I didn't uh, dwell on her having uh, done that. But the current literature does not support the efficacy of, let's say, Kenalog injection. Um, that, that's been looked at in small series, including some prospective series compared to placebo um, or, or doing nothing. And uh, thus far, um, there's really no evidence to support that that works. And, um, in, in terms of uh, other agents such as biologics, I, I'm not aware of any strong data to support uh, injecting a biologic at, at a stricture site. Okay, so a question uh, that I'd uh, like to hear the answers from both. Um, considering the uh, aggressive prognosis for many patients who have upper uh, GI uh, Crohn's disease, do you have a preferred pro uh, biologic to go to first, if you have to make that call? I don't have a preferred biologic, but I would, my experience generally, most patients are started on anti-TNF therapy. That's where we have sort of the most data on in this, in this field of limited data. I think I would use MR proactively to survey them because it's very difficult to endoscopically survey them. So this is someone I would be imaging maybe three, three months after I start them on a biologic. And then again, you know, maybe every six months for the first year. And, and then serially after that, because that's really the only way you're going to get to know if you're getting deep remission. And I, I think I would look at the big picture, too, to see what biologic would be best in the context of the patient's entire history. You know, there are certain risk factors like TB exposure that might make me use one um, biologic class as opposed to another. <laughs> 
So here's a simple yet difficult one. What age do you stop surveillance, colon surveillance, or do you stop it for IBD? I think, I think we don't yet know the answer for even the average risk population, what age to stop it. Cert certainly it depends on their, not chronological, but biologic age, if they've had dysplasia before, how their control of disease activity is and patient preference. I have some people I'm surveying still in the 80s, whereas others feel when they have a lot of comorbidity at even age 65, they don't, if I feel like I'm not gonna intervene or they would not be great candidates for intervention based on what I find, then I think there's life expectancy of five or 10 years is I think minimum for sustained benefit from surveillance. So people with a lot of comorbidity who the life expectancy is less, I would, I would stop. But if they're a very healthy 80 year old, I'd keep going. Just right, and, and I agree with that. I think we can draw from the average risk colorectal cancer screening experience where maybe 15 years ago the recommendation was stop at age 75. You'll still see that in a few guidelines, but the current literature-based recommendations are to individualize it per patient, look at the patient's uh, life expectancy, as Ashwin had said, and if they have five to 10 years of life expectancy, then I think it's certainly reasonable to do it. And then, of course, there's patient preference, too. Some patients do want to continue. Others say, look, I'm you know, 80 years old. I just want to stop at this point. And, you know, of course, we'll take that in, you know, into account. I mean, for patients who've been having this for 20, 30 years, there's also sort of a strong psychologic link to having a colonoscopy. And if you say, okay, I'm not gonna scope you anymore, it's almost like you're telling them, okay, you're gonna die in the next two or three years, and it's not worth rescheduling. So that sort of communication has to be very nuanced with the patient when you decide to stop surveillance. Okay. Uh, again, a question that I, I would like to pose to both of you. The, the pediatricians seem to uh, do an upper endoscopy in everyone with a new diagnosis. And 18-year-old, uh, newly diagnosed, they'll do the upper. I don't think we would necessarily, well, I'm interested to hear, do you do an upper endoscopy in every newly diagnosed patient, and what would be your threshold? Because obviously a lot of ileal, colonic disease might present with uh, upper GI symptoms or upper abdominal symptoms as well. What's your threshold? I, I do not routinely do upper endoscopy in everybody with newly diagnosed Crohn's disease. I would say about 20, 20 to 30 percent of the newly diagnosed patients, I would probably do an upper endoscopy if their symptoms seem atypical to what I would expect based on imaging. Let's say they have very prominent abdominal pain, but imaging and their colonoscopy shows only sort of mild colonic disease, and I'm not sure I understand why they're having pain. In those people, I would do an upper endoscopy. Obviously, you want to also look for things like celiac disease just because they have Crohn's doesn't mean they don't have other things that can show up on upper endoscopy. Someone with persistent anemia where I don't have an explanation for it, upper endoscopy, even if they're asymptomatic, would be helpful to make sure they don't have celiac. And, and I concur with that. Um, you know, if you suspect celiac or if the patient has significant upper GI symptoms that would normally warrant an EGD, or um, if the patient has, you know, other factors, imaging um, and such that demonstrate something in the upper GI tract, I only do, you know, a lower GI investigation. Though I will say it does vary, even in our institution among colleagues, many are quicker to go ahead and schedule both. And then there are direct access programs where sometimes patients with suspected IBD will be referred for both by their primary docs. So just one more question. So for ulcers in the small bowel, you know, diagnosed just on capsule, how convinced are you that it's Crohn's and you treat for Crohn's with biologics without getting tissue? When do you need tissue? I think sometimes all you can do is make the best clinical diagnosis that you can. Um, and, you know, if you're convinced based upon, you know, your history, physical, and all the available data, it may not be feasible to get tissue, but, you know, you need to move forward. Certainly if there's a response, um, I think that kind of uh, will help, you know, it could certainly be a placebo response. But I think in general, um, you know, if you're clinically convinced that it is Crohn's disease, even without tissue, if you see it on uh, capsule, I think it is worthwhile to uh, proceed you know, with treatment, especially if the patient is quite ill, if there's been a weight loss, other alarm features, um, you know, you carefully review the risks, benefits, stating, look, we, we don't have tissue, but Crohn's disease is not a tissue diagnosis. Um, it's basically, it's still a clinical diagnosis. So, so I have a follow-up question to that. I, my concerns are when we have a patient with rather soft 
uh, findings for Crohn's disease, whatever criteria you have that might suggest it's in that direction, but really still a low uh, likelihood of, of disease, what's your sort of threshold to say this is Crohn's disease? My concern always is if that's the only finding, we're probably going to overdose, overdiagnose patients, and then it's off to the races with the therapies because the first line therapy, second line therapy, third line therapy might not work because essentially we're treating IBS and uh, background noise. So that's a question because the, the diagnostic yields that you quoted were basically just that. In other words, findings, right. they weren't able to correlate it with the development or prognosis of Crohn's. I, I think that's a great follow-up question. I think the patient has to have, as I mentioned, alarm symptoms, for lack of a better descriptor. You know, somebody with, where you're convinced, you know, if you think the patient has irritable bowel, you see some small afe either on a capsule study or as we often do in a TI, there are other differential diagnoses. You know, it could be in, in the mimics discussion yesterday, um, you know, we discussed um, the broader differential diagnosis. It could be PrEP related. Um, you know, I know, Asher, many years ago, you had mentioned this uh, inflammatory IBS entity, which is still not quite, you know, understood, and I, I've not heard much about that recently, but I think you have to weigh the, the risks and benefits of treatment, especially for Crohn's, which is, you know, essentially a biologic and or immunomodulator or combo therapy, which do have significant risks. So if the patient's quality of life is not significantly impaired and there's not been weight loss, severe anemia, or other significant features, I think it's worthwhile taking a watch and weight, weight approach. Yeah, Ashwin. I, I agree. I'm, I'm very careful in these patients to convey the uncertainty about diagnosis. I, I would not pretend that I'm confident that it's Crohn's disease because then you're essentially consigning them to being on some immune suppressive ther therapy for 10, 20, 30 years and they may they may you know move somewhere else, start seeing somebody else, really get convinced that they have Crohn's and I've sort of seen many patients go down the rabbit hole that way. I think these are patients, some patients response to therapy is sometimes necessary to establish a diagnosis, but I leave the duration of therapy very open-ended, potentially even considering stopping therapy at some point to see if things recur, and clearly if things get better with time, get better with treatment. In some patients, the diagnosis is so uncertain that I would stop treatment and then follow them and see if things recur, and if things recur, that to me establishes the diagnosis. So sometimes you do have to start people on treatment, but not indefinite. Keep, I would continue thinking about the uncertainty for at least several years. Okay. And, and then I think just one other important follow-up is you often need to be detective and repeatedly address the question of NSAID use and other factors that can clearly uh, mimic uh, Crohn's disease. Okay. I mean, just to clarify, I don't know if it's my early onset or advanced dementia. I'm not sure in what context I use the words inflammatory IBS. I just want to be cautious that 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 you're not implying that if the patient looks like IBS, that there's some inflammatory component that you might want to treat with uh, anti-inflammatory medications. I just want to be clear that there's IBS. Right, right. No, it's just right. kind of, uh, you had mentioned it years ago during a capsule course, and uh, basically just to describe, Dementia. you know, what do you do? You see these small, you know, AFA on a capsule, but you're convinced the patient really has irritable bowel by wrong criteria or just your general clinical sense. and. Um, you know, you don't want to really move to label them as Crohn's, which does have significant implications, insurance and, and otherwise. And I, I will say to follow up too on Ashwan's comment, it often I think makes us very uncomfortable. We'll often get referrals of patients labeled with Crohn's disease, I should say labeled, but who've been diagnosed with Crohn's, who then, you know, will scope what we have absolutely no evidence, but they've come from another institution, moved from out of the area. We have limited evidence before. And they, they're already on biologic saying, I feel great, I don't want to stop it. You know, and I think it often puts us in a somewhat difficult position. And in one case, we went as far as getting um, biopsy reports from an outside institution. It took about a month or two. And our pathologist said, yes, there is some evidence suggestive or cons that could be consistent with Crohn's. So we did feel comfortable in that instance, you know, continuing the infliximab um, at the current rate, because you really don't want to stop it if the patient says, look, I, you know, I've gotten much, much better on it and I'm fearful. But I think it does make it, you know, difficult for us at times. All right. With that, I think we're going to end what was a really great session. I really want to thank the audience for listening and for all the speakers for giving really excellent talks. Thank so you. thank you.